mean to be humming, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's great. Okay, so let's get started. Okay. Um, so we're on page 111. Let's start one paragraph from the top. Okay. Okay. Ready to roll? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He he said to him, Amrlai, Emilo Khadato Yadis the Anna Artiraba. You do you know something new of which I am naked? Amrle Ama. He replied, say. Omar Omar, Kala de Hadra Beena Laminda. He said, The returning voice, I want to know. Barnash Yahib Kala Bechakla, Oba Asar Akhra. A person who, who raises their voice in the field or somewhere else. Bahadra Kala Akhra Velo Yadia. And another voice comes back. We usually call that an echo, <laughs> but here it's. Not exactly an echo. It's it's unknown. Amar le i chasida kadisha al mila do kamakolin itaru. He replied, "O holy pious one, concerning this matter, many voices have been awakened. The kama diktukin have a kama rav mesifta, and many subtle points." Uh, you know, like like a, a methodology of, of, of reading into every little word, some meaning made from the head of the academy. The Kadnachis Rav Masifta, Omar. When the, when the head of the academy descended, he said as follows. This is how the matter has been established in the heavenly yeshiva and the secret of the matter is precious. Okay, let's read Zeb uh, 172 through 174. 172, he said to him, Rabbi Shimon asked the spiritual messenger to enlighten him about a certain matter that eludes him. The word naked renders uh, uh, ar artira, which could imply uh, here lacking. Above C note one four. Alternatively, artira means about which I am disturbed. Okay, so if you remember, just, just I guess we do have to back up for a moment to understand the context. Uh, we actually started uh, the whole, the whole um, Rav Masifta with a little bit of a discussion about the, the generation of the desert, the Dardea, and part of the point of the Rav Masifta, specifically in the beginning, is to kind of um, re-glorify them from other rabbinic um, kind of put downs and, and saying that they have no portion of the world to come, which the Rav Misifta does not agree with. So in that in that kind of vein, uh, he he says praise of that generation, the generation of Moses in the desert, and and that they will be revived in the world to come. And then he says, so that's where we begin today's session. How do you know something new of which I am naked? Meaning, it's an expression like I, I, I never, like, I don't know. I'm totally unfamiliar with this. This is totally new. So it could be the way of the Zohar saying, this is truly a chidush. This is the, the Torah of the Zohar. You're not going to find this in the Talmud. This, this. And true enough, uh, ever since the Zohar, the Kabbalistic community uh, is are big fans of the generation that died in the desert that are now known as the Dordea, the generation of knowers. Doesn't simply mean knowledge, but it means da'at, it means awareness of divinity. 
Okay, so now he's starting to go. He, he jumps right in. Uh, I guess eventually we'll see more how this connects to that. This idea of this of this kind of heavenly, or not necessarily heavenly, but spiritual reverberation of sound. But it's really not just simply an echo. It's something else. And we're going to be learning about that. So go ahead with the, uh, the next note. Uh, 173, the returning voice, an echo which seems mysterious. And 174, when the head of the uh, academy descended from the heavenly academy. On this academy, see, you know, previous notes. Okay, let's continue. And come to the There are three voices that are never lost. Besides for Torah and prayer, for, you know, when you study Torah and you, and you pray, the, the, the voice ascends on high and splits the heavens. Now, truth be told, there's some caveats there where uh, I believe it's a Zohar, Zo I don't remember, one of the strata, of the Zo a stratum of the kind of Zohar texts, it might be... Uh, or something where it says, well, you know, when you pray with kavana, then it ascends. But if you don't have kavana, the prayer just, you know, kind of stays here in, in this world. Okay, so let's assume you do pray, you do have kavana. And, and by the way, it also says when you do finally pray with kavana, it also elevates retroactively all of the earlier um, you know, the, the earlier prayers that didn't ascend yet. Okay, just as a side, not that we need to know that for now. Because here he's really just saying, in addition to that, we have these other cries that just don't go away. Not necessarily because they're so mystical, but they're very powerful and sad, despair, okay? But there are other voices that do not ascend, yet are yet are not lost. In other words, what we're talking about is not they're not so spiritual, I said. They're not ascending, but they don't just dissipate and, 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 and get lost. Now, there's a theory in the Zohar, I don't exactly know what it means, is that when a voice ends, it somehow gets absorbed into the to the ground or to the cracks in the ground, but not these voices. These voices have some quality that they just keep going. The air just carries them around everywhere, here and there and everywhere. So these are three. The first one is the voice of a woman in labor when she's giving birth on the birth stool. That voice goes, it sweeps from one end of the world to the other. Any person, when they're dying from this world, that voice of the soul, there's a certain type of tension of the soul being torn from the body. And in that trauma of that death trauma, a voice, a sound, a vibration, maybe is, is, is a word to, way to translate it, emanates into the world that doesn't just dissipate, doesn't just end. Number three is the voice of a snake. It sheds its skin. When it sheds its skin, the voice sweeps from one end of the world to the other. I mean, think of a snake. First of all, we know snakes are, you know, famous because they're right in the Garden of Eden, misleading Adam and Eve. But also you have this very powerful concept of the mishcha de chivya, the snake skin, which is really a klipa because it's not like ordinary skin, which we do shed a little bit of ordinary skin, but it's not like you literally shed your whole skin and start over with a new skin, but a snake does. So, the, so it's it's almost a traumatic thing for it to like 
like unclothe itself from its own skin. And that's a big deal. It's a birth yeah. pang. What's that? Like, like a birth pang. Yeah, it's similar. Like it's you're emerging from this exterior shell, which was you, which was your regular skin before. I mean, they're all they're all mo modes of passing from one level of being into another, like being a unborn child, the fetus in the womb into being born or being alive and then being dead and at the same time coming out into the other side. The afterlife, the Gan Eden or Gehenna, whatever it is that awaits the person. Okay. The voice of the snake, we did that. So let's continue on to 112. Or actually, no, let's read note 174, please, Sev. 175. 175. Yeah. These are uh, three voices. This list of three derives from a longer list in Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer. Uh, the voices of six go from one end of the earth to the other, and their voices are not heard. When the wood of a tree that yields fruit is cut down, its cry goes forth from one end of the world to the other, voice is not heard. When the snake sheds its skin, when a woman is divorced from her husband, when a woman joins with her husband uh, in the first act of intercourse, when the infant comes forth from its mother's womb, when the soul departs from the body. Here in the Zohar, the cry of the infant being born is replaced by the cry of its mother in labor on voices or words splitting heaven. See other place in the Zohar, including Idra Zutza. Uh, the birth stool renders the Zoharic neologism uh, kalbita, which may derive from the rare rabbinic uh, term uh, kalbitrin, kalbi, kalbintarin, apparently a corruption of the Greek uh, klinobathrin. I would just give up by now, right. Sam, on these words. Huh? Right, there, yeah, a stepper stool placed before the bed, okay. And then he, he references other places. Okay. So maybe this is obvious or, or not. I don't know. I didn't realize it until I started like, I don't know. I guess I don't know that much about snakes shedding their skin. So I was just curious about this whole thing, like how they do it, whether like, is it saying something like, like the rate, the the sound waves are actually the the way that they affect the removal of the skin. And I don't know it turns out like it's a whole Torah around how this happens. There might be like fluids that it emits, like some sort of like anesthetic. But anyway, I don't know. Maybe someone else knows a lot more about that. But I just realized, and maybe this is the basic thing: is like all of these voices are associated with some sort of expelling of something, right? I mean, that's like. That's all of them, or and it's like I guess the question is, you know, is that just sort of like, uh, you know, uh, simon or seba, you know, like is that the thing here, or is it, um, you know, what is it about this? Is it that there's just a voice that, like you, the way you mentioned it, sort of described it as like, oh, maybe the common thing here is, tr it's true too that these voices are all about something sad in a way like a state that's being left behind the baby is there the skin is on the life is you know coexisting body and soul and now it's like moving on or is it maybe the thing here why this these voices are so kind of there's a perpetuity to them is because it's like a pain that's associated with allowing something else to continue a life to be born a skin to sort of be shed from a snake i don't know a soul to be able to find its higher purpose i don't know if it's very interesting what yeah i mean in growth there is pain in, in birth there is pain whether it's for the mother or the newborn uh or or the snake respectively of its snakiness um okay good observation let's continue <laughs> In Hasida Kadisha, Kama Mila Darava Akira. Oh, holy, that we're on 112 now. A oh, holy pious one, how great and precious is this matter? Elaine Cullen Ma Isabid Minayu, Laon Aser Olin Vishoran. 
What happens to these voices? Where do they enter and settle? It's like, what do you mean? Like they literally go from one end of the world to another. Don't they eventually have to settle down? They're going to have, you know, usually it's like somebody's crying out because they want somebody to hear and respond. And then once that's done, so then the voice, you don't need to, a child stops crying for candy once they have the candy or once they're threatened, I don't know. Um, so where does this voice go? It goes everywhere, but it's got to settle somewhere eventually. So that's Zohar's question. These voices are of pain and they go flying through the air from one end of the world to the other. They enter into cracks and crevices, holes in the earth. And are hidden away there. The cad. Now yoy. it's almost as if they're like alive. They're there, but they're still like you can wake them up, them up again. Again, this is not a real physical thing. They, the metaphor is the sound, the cry, but the actual thing is an energy that's now concealed in the cracks of the rocks. And when a person raises his voice, they are aroused by that sound. So a person in talking there or crying there awakens those sounds. The voice of a snake is not aroused by a person's voice. How is it aroused? By striking. When a person strikes a hit, a blow, the hidden voice of the snake is aroused. And no other one. For some reason, look, the snake has got a certain snaky viciousness to it. So the very thing that you would think would protect you, which is the counter assertiveness, uh, using a, a stick to threaten that would like I would logically think that that would get the snake to keep quiet but we're not even talking about the snake here we're talking about the sound the cry of the snake that shed its skin that's now entered into this crevice so in order to awaken it to make its sound to be heard to come back up and, and be heard it's by striking it with a stick, which is like, it's kind attracts kind. Matzah minas mino, chosa benir. Like it's this kind of concept of, it's in halacha, but here it's, it, it means that a similar energetic thing will awaken it. Okay? Sorry, it's so new agey today. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with new age. Unless there is, when there is, but when there isn't, you know. Okay, let's continue. Kala itar basar, kala zina basar zina. So, sound arouses sound, kind to kind. Let's do two more lines, and then we'll do Zeb. We'll do one seventy six and one seventy seven. On the day of Rosh Hashanah, the sound of the shofar arouses the sound of the shofar. Uh, okay. Before we continue, let's have Zev uh, read notes one seventy six and seventy seven. 176. The voice of a snake is not aroused, except when a person strikes a blow. The sound arouses only the voice of the snake, not the voice of the woman in labor or the person departing from the world. Uh, so at a simple level, it's not even talking about necessarily the disembodied voice. It could be talking about the actual voice of the snake, or like I read it earlier, it could be talking about once the snake sound enters into the crevice, it can only be awakened. That's the straight reading of the Zohar. Once these, like, banging with a stick sound awakens it. Um, so this is com compared to Tezvos and Hedron. 
on every species seeking its own kind. Um, Bhavakama, uh, where it says it was taught in the Mishnah, anything attached to something subject to impurity is itself subject to impurity. Anything attached to something that remains pure will itself remain pure. It was taught in a Brisa. Um, Rabbi Eliezer said, not for nothing did, uh, did the starling follow the raven, but because of its kind. See Bracious Rabbah and elsewhere in the Zohar. 177 says on the day of Rosh Hashanah, the sound of the shofar uh, stimulates Bina, uh, pictured as a divine shofar, proclaims redemption and liberation. On earthly and sephirotic shofars, see other places in Zohar, Zohar Hadash, and also notes on Bina as, as uh, the, the shofar of liberation. Right. right. Okay, so we've done stuff on that. It's worthwhile to, you know, repeat it, but we're not going to. We're going to continue. The snake inclines to evil to strike and kill. Consequently, I, I skipped two. Uh, no, actually, I didn't skip two lines. Go ahead. The, 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 the snake inclines to evil to strike and kill. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure that this is Arche de Nachash Lavish Ihu Lakalo Lomocha Bahu Kala Mamash Lo Itar Kala Dai Nachash Elabasar Zine. Okay, the stakes. Oh, I'll just read up and you know, is we'll, it, is, am I are you further along? Um, I, or is it different? Uh, Text. No, I think we're we're good. So we're good within a line of each other. The snake inclines to evil to strike and kill. The voice of the snake is aroused only by its own kind. Yeah, we're in the same. Okay, place. we're good. Yeah. yeah. And and it is when a person strikes the ground with a stick. Calling its kind. Then the voice of the snake is aroused to respond to its kind, and this mystery is concealed. Okay, let's go continue. Rabbi Shimon said, Certainly, this matter is sealed, and I am amazed. Amar Rabbi Shimon, Vaday Mila Da Mila Satima, he Visavana Ech Shlomo Malka Loyada Mila Da. And I'm amazed how King Solomon didn't know this. So we'll find out in the note what it was that King Solomon didn't know. But that's like a big deal to find out something that King, so King Solomon was supposed to be the smartest person who ever lived. So he figured out just about everything. So if he couldn't figure this out and it was revealed in you know, through one of these, the messenger to the Rashbi in heaven, uh, that's a big deal. And that's why the Rashbi was very excited about these new revelations. Notes on that. 170, um, 178, 179. Uh, 178, the snake inclines to evil. Fittingly, the snake associated with the demonic other side is aroused by the violent act of striking the ground. <clears throat> 179, King Solomon did not know this. Rabbi Shimon is alluding to Proverbs 30, 19, which says, three things are too wondrous for me and four I cannot know. The way of the eagle in the sky, the way of the snake on a rock, the way of a ship in the heart of the sea, and the way of a man in or with a young woman. How could Solomon the wise not know the way of the snake on a rock, understood here as how the voice of the snake shedding its skin flies through the air and is hidden in crevices. Okay, so these are mysteries that even Solomon wasn't able to figure out. Big, big deal, big things. It's interesting that he said three things and then he lists four things. Oh, yeah, that's true because the Zohar, the one consistency the Zohar has is that it's inconsistent to its source material. <laughs> uh, just like before, it had three things, and, and the source, what could be seen as the source, or the picketer of Elazar, or, or I don't know, source, but the teachings of Rabbi Elazar 
right? Uh, Madrash had uh, a couple extra things. They had six things. Six. So that's the only consistency is that it's inconsistent. Okay. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's, leaving, it's leaving some things out. We well, always come across this expression, three and not for four, or like in Sefer Yitzira, 10 yeah. but not, not 11. Yeah, and, 10 and not nine, yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. So three and not four, and three and not six. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's got to be some significance in it. I, I don't know what it is. But, uh, It's interesting because because um, a couple of the the Picard Abelazar ones involve like marriage and divorce, you know, like two separate people joining in union, like the the the, the wedding night, and, and and divorce, like a couple that had become a couple had become one you know unit to some degree, are broken apart. So. Zohar doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm not saying the Zohar doesn't think uh, deeply and, and powerfully about those things, but doesn't mention them here. Uh, at, at, so, so yeah, you, you know, you can ask yourself, what, why, why the, why these three? You know, well, the, you know, there's a thread somewhere here of something in common, where you have, um, you know, the the one thing um, that the Chabad Rabbi here in Princeton always points out. Is yeah. that the the snake is um, is the one animal other than humans who uh, that copulates uh, uh, face to face? Interesting. The Chabad rabbi knows a lot of things I don't know. <laughs> well, you, I have no idea. idea. Yeah. This 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 is new to me. Right. I believe him because it's not like I would. How would I know? Very you know, Ch Chabad rabbis are very into kosher copulation. You know, they write books about it. And, uh, the, I, I'm, not even go, I'm not even going down that rat hole. Let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. See, that was, it was a double entendre. I wasn't, I wasn't sure where that double entendre went. Was it that he's an expert in snakes or in the, the action that he was describing? Uh, yeah, but this whole uh, thing is full of double entendre because, you know, snake and nahash, Nahash, I, I, I know Rabbi is always a little suspicious of my gematria, but... Um, oh, I'm, I'm always happy to hear them. I'm always entertained. Nahash, when you see Nahash, you also have to think Mashiach, because ah, it's, uh, it's three, 358, which is the, um, which is the total of the, uh, of the dreidel also. Look at that. That was because it's also like Choshen. So it's like the Choshen of the Beit HaMikdash. That's the Mashiach. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just making it up. David really is saying stuff. David yeah. has these things. They come to him in the night, you know? Yeah. No, I said the voices do also. You know, it bothers me. Anyway, um, no, Ben, I'm absolutely on the same page as you are, okay? Okay. David's a natural, but then you never know, you know, in, in David's presence, it's going to rub off a little bit on you. Yeah. yeah that wasn't what the rabbi was talking about. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Let's go on. Amarle Shlomo, Amarle Shlomo, Malka Minda Yada, Velo Kolkach. Okay, so we're on page 113. He replied, King Solomon certainly knew, but not so deeply. Don't think he's saying King Solomon had no idea. He had an idea, but he didn't know it on this level. What he didn't know was in that voice, right, the snake's voice, its effectiveness and how it settles. That was still a mystery to him. Continue. Ravisif the Haki Amar. The head of the academy said as follows. Dikduka da loyada shlomo malka. This subtle point that King Solomon did not know for. Look, that voice is a compound. It's composed of spirit and soul. 
Keep going. Vahaval garme mitzvona de bistra umeshatata bavira. Breath of bones. Okay, well, breath usually and bones are not connected, but here they are. So we're, we're so it's a talk. It's it's an energetic part of the bone, not the actual bone. It's like, you know, you'd say the the form of the bone, the air of the bone, and the pain of flesh, which is which is a reference to the curse of, of Adam and Eve. Eve's, you know, the the the, the pain of the flesh of, of giving birth. But it could also be referencing the the krechts of aliveness, the the tzibrusenkeit of survival, just the physical pain that our bodies sometimes experience and then carry around even after the actual trauma is in the rearview mirror. So <laughs> into the next world, perhaps even you know, like the neshamas heckle that it's carrying around with it. They've made it these four levels. Okay. And it sweeps through the air. Each one separates from the other. So they each have their own identity to some degree. They're able to, they come out and then they separate. It reaches that place that it goes into. It settles as if dead. All those sorcerers and wizards know these matters through their witchcraft. And they bow down, or they bend down. Freudian slip, we're talking about sorcerers, I thought they would bow down, but they bend down to the ground and hear this voice, the mingling of spirits, souls, and breath of bones. And they and they the so again, one of the things that we read about in the Torah of all these prohibitions about necromancy and divining, divination, the div, don't divine from the dead, it had to do with trying to access some uh, spirit that would either talk through a dead body's bone or the person go to the cemetery or just make some sense, there are different techniques they had. So here the czar is kind of like, I don't want to say borrowing, but getting awfully close, almost getting out of its lane to go, to acknowledge that there's a crossover between what the czar is describing and what sorcerers do. It's not the same, but it is the same. Meaning they access it in their way. We access it in a holy way. Okay. So I have a question. Uh, doesn't this, uh, uh, you know, go a little bit into what's often been typified as the practical Kabbalah? I, I think it's 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 definitely making us aware of these things. I don't know if it's practical enough yet because it's not translating what you would do per se to mm -hmm. be this type of sorcerer. But it's giving you a little bit of, you know, something. But I, mean, I, think it's in, I think it's interesting, Rabbi, that we began off this evening talking about a maggot, a storyteller. And, yeah. you know, the clean version of everything we're just about to hear about voices is precisely that, which is the maggot, which is the heavenly voice that certain people hear, okay, um, which uh, comes through to the, um, the, through the soul of the righteous. So if you ever listen to the test, the mystical testimonies about Rav Karo's uh, Magid or, or, sure. or, or, or of um, uh, the Ram Hal's Magid, um, you know, they, they, they lived with almost like a possessed soul within them. Yeah. Or they had a possessed soul. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, there's definitely this a concept of, of uh, you know, some, some uh, heavenly magen. So, which means on the evil side of this, this equation, are these sorcerers who are able to access these cries and then 
they'll gain information. So for example, perhaps there, there's a concept in the Talmud, there's a whole discussion in the Talmud and Brachot. Um, I'm doing that, the top 10 teachings, I try to do a page of Talmud every week. So one of the conversations uh, that, that, that takes up quite a bit of, of uh, time in the Talmud is, do the dead people know what's happening in this world? And there's arguments back and forth. And, and some of the proofs are, yeah, because this person did know something, this, this like spirit knew things. And one of the responses is, yeah, they do know things as long as like new people are arriving. That, that they hear, like when a dead person comes into their, a new dead, a new dead spirit enters into their world, that person conveys information and then they'll know it. But that doesn't mean that the average uh, spirit of a, you know, what, what Westerners would call a ghost, what we call a neshama, has information about the whole universe. It just means they have access at certain moments to certain things. So let's just assume that that's true. That's the halacha, you know, that's because that the Gemara can't argue on, that the Gemara accepts as, as, as a given. So let's just say, hey, if you want to find out, you know, how the stock market is going to be, so you'd ask the, the soul who had the last conference, you're not going to get the information from the CEO of Pfizer, but the guy who was just died working for Pfizer, you know, you could get his information on the way up or down or wherever he's going. And that's, so, so that's, I'm giving you a silly example, uh, but at least people can relate to the stock tip, you know, from uh, from uh, from uh, the Shama. So that's what a, a wizard or a sorcerer would be doing, trying to access this, you know, spirit to find out whatever advantage it, it needs to take in this world. Okay, sorry if it was a silly example, but I tried. Okay. This is the ghost from the ground, which is a verse in Isaiah 29. So Solomon ought to know what happens to that voice, but he never found out. Happy is your share, you know, Rebbe, I, oh, truly virtuous one. You know, you've found these words of truth. Um, let's have Zev read note 180, please. Uh, 180, that voice is composed of spirit. The echoing voice consists of ruach, spirit, uh, nafsha, soul, breath of bones, a spiritual element lingering within the bones of the grave, and pain of flesh, that is the pain of experienced by a woman in labor, a person dying, or a snake shedding its skin. The clause each one separates from the other alludes also to the painful separation of body and soul at the moment of death. When specifically the voice of someone dying reaches its hiding place, it settles there. Sorcer sorcerers know how to contact that voice, and they namely the voice's components convey the information to those sorcerers, providing them with whatever they seek to know about the dead. On this passage, so it says compared to the book of Samuel. On this passage, see... Yeah, that's when, or I'm I'm that's when they brought up uh, when Saul um, brought up Samuel. From the dead, he had a, you know... The, the witch of Endor. Yeah. So we've got... <laughs> we have this, like, weird relationship with witchcraft. Where it's like, yeah, it's alongside our beliefs. And Shishmuel gets very upset about it, right? He's, he's... Of course, yeah, yeah. Who would be happy to be woken up like that? <laughs> yeah, but, but it's actually a very positive story because he basically says, okay, you're going to die tomorrow. But um, he ends with the word e me, which is that he says, you'll be, be with, with me. Himself. And it's, it's a very, it is a very, he's basically saying that you, you're, yeah, you're going to die, but you're heading to a very, good very good, high bad, bad, Good news and bad news. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, and there's, but, there's, I mean, I, I, 
I listened to this very interesting lecture from this professor uh, at UCLA who her specialty is magic. And I, I totally forgot her name, but she's very good. But, but the point is, is that, that um, you know, like magic and religion and, and science always have this like um, like this coexistence, not of equals, but but like some people are going to go to magic. Uh, and some people want to know that it's going to be a little bit in the religion. Or, or, or so on and so forth. And, and um, is there part of the allure uh, or actually the fear of a book like the Zohar because a regular westernized person thinks it's too magical and therefore anti-rational, anti-science? Um, I, I mean, I don't see it that way, but I acknowledge why somebody might, you know? Uh, and the Zohar is not one of the more practical Kabbalah books, by and large. It's not, I mean, practical Kabbalah is often translated as Kabbalah Masiut, that you can do something with, namely, unleash some power to your benefit in the world. Make a golem. Uh, what's that? Make a golem. Make a golem. Um get get stock tips i don't know like again you know now in israel a lot of the common people and the not such common people uh are heavily rely on uh kabbalists who are basically like magicians you know who are how do i say it they're I don't want to call them sorcerers, um, but they're kind of like do all these very mysterious things. Um, some of them are shady. I don't know if any of them are for real. Maybe, maybe not. It's 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 hard to say. It's a whole industry. It's a is, whole business. Um, isn't that basically what a Baal Shem was like before the Baal Shem Tov, like the other? It, it, yeah, it is. So, so, so. I mean, that's a powerful thing to know that the Baal Shem, the founder of the Hasidic movement, was using these magical tools. You know, but then the movement itself moved away from that. So it's a very interesting, very much like this Zohar here today, like acknowledging these these powers. Uh, but look, there's some very similar uh, stories in the non-Hasidic world, even with the, even in like brisk of almost like magic based on faith in God. So, you know, we don't call it magic. We call it a muna and a nace, a miracle, because we don't think it's a formula. We think it's divine. Um, but sometimes some of the stuff gets so murky, like when you have these Kabbalists who, you know, um, people pay them to curse other people, business, like very weird, like very shady Kabbalists, you know what I'm saying? Like there's Kabbalists and these are, to call them Kabbalists is, they're popular. Um, I don't know that I would call them Kabbalists. They're more like, magicians that take a, a lot of people's money it, it's hard to it's hard to know some of them are for real and some of them are not it's hard to know once once there's that much money involved and that much you know power involved it's hard to know which ones are more for real or not and that's, like, that's everybody... right. it's, it's whatever a platform it's always hard to know whether a platform like in technology innovation is like purely like a good platform when it's connected to a payment system you know like stripe and square and paypal and zelle and then it becomes confusing is it a payment platform or is it actually like a platform like a product a service and so i think that's what happens with some of the in, in the religious space it's like they've fused the two 
And if you would have a pure form platform, then it might be easier to know what, what it, it is. It is, it is a power and money, you know, blinds the eye. So it, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I could see how somebody, uh, even a good person, could become um, wrapped up in, in giving kind of magical advice because of the money they get out of it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard one to say. But, but even if there wasn't money, like uh, I think it was, uh, wasn't Rabbi Keturah, Keturah? You know, it wasn't it wasn't about him getting, you know, like he didn't have like 16 Mercedes Benz in the driveway. But it clearly was that he uh, people believed that he affected the future, you know, uh, or, or that people at least had to go to him to get his blessing, because if they didn't, then. Yeah, I mean, and here's the thing. I, I, believe, I believe in theory in that. I believe in that stuff. I just don't know when it's real and when it's just, um, you know, not. It's hard to know. So, do, do you yeah. know, there's so much, Rabbi, there's so much of this around. Um, a friend of ours who passed away two years ago, who you knew, yes. um, he, he basically acted like a local, um, what I would say, um, uh, white magician, okay, in this area. And, um, and people get involved in- New Jersey so or New York? What, this is in New what Jersey. Area is this? And this is in New Jersey. And, um, and there's so much of this sort of, people get involved in all this black arts and whatever. He's telling me about this group of women um, who got together and they did all these sort of strange incantations and whatever. And then they started getting really worried as groups of black cats started showing up at their doors and everything. And they came to him in order to get um, kind of release from what they, the, the mess that they'd put themselves into. But, but this wasn't, this was like, so this was just bored. This is an example of bored suburban women, but there's just so much of this craziness that's out there, right? And, and there's an aspect of it that, that there's there's an industry on the other side which, which provides the purification as well this is what happens when you don't have soul cycle in new jersey like they... <laughs> i tried to bring i tried to bring them in ben also and you know um but uh, it was um but, but th that was i just gave you a tiny little hint of a story of of, of what goes on out there it is kind of craziness yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's it's wild. Yeah, yeah. Uh. And and this goes back also to uh, uh, the RE who apparently could read people's heads. Yeah, things like that. So yeah, so, so so like the RE I trust. You know, the RE I I, I would go to in a minute. Um, that that that's the question. You know, like like. Um, you know, also you, you have to, there's a person's track record. It, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, they're not, not all people who, who hang out a shingle to, to give a blessing are the same, you know, uh, you, you got, you got to have, uh, you have to have Amuna, you have to have faith. And on the other hand, you have to have Chachma, you have to have insight and, and das, you know, you got to know the difference. Das la You have to be able to tell the difference between night and day. Between, you know, it's the, the night and day is pretty clear in the physical world. But there's there's benash there's 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 das, there's there's dawn, there's 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 the times of the day that are not clearly defined as day and night, and and they could be one or the other or both even. And we have to figure that out in terms of, of, you know, not giving up on faith because then it could be argued like, okay, so why and there? Why just believe in in Torah, but not believe in Sadiqim who can continue that right now? So it's a subtle distinction where you have to believe in miracles. You don't have to believe in a particular person's ability to do miracles. Um, you know, you have to believe the idea of the miracle. 
know, you have to, so, but, but how, how it is applied and who gets to decide, so to speak, that's, that's, that's a, that's an ongoing question. And, and we know it's rife with abuse, you know, um, and, and maybe regular people also are miraculous, not even capitalists, just, just, reg, you know, each one of us may have a couple of miracles not up our sleeves, because then that's a magic trick, but more like we're the conduit for it. The Lamed Vafniks. What? The Lamed Vafniks. Yeah, yeah, or even not, even not. You know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like, can send you on a mission without you knowing it. You know, like, you, you give a bracha and it comes true. It, you know, the, the truth is maybe it was going to happen anyway. Um, maybe not. Maybe, who knows? Who really knows? Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, anyway, let's let's uh, do a little bit and wrap this up. Had barnash itar kala miyad mischabron itar hahu kala velasle rishula arka yatir. When a person arouses a voice, they immediately mingle, and that returning voice is aroused. And it is not in power to extend any longer, only as much as the voice aroused by the person, no more. If the person prolongs his voice, the echo does not extend as far with him. But rather is aroused towards the end of his voice. Since it can't be prolonged. My time begin the reason. Because when the voice first issued, it extended from one end of the world to the other. And now that it has entered there, remember it found its place in the Rock, it cannot extend any further. The Halesle Asalis Pashta Taman kids no room to roam as before. Zeb, why don't you please read note 181? 181. When a person arouses a voice, when someone shouts outdoors, the components of the three painful voices of a woman labor, a person dying in a snake shedding its skin, emerge from hiding and combine into an echo. This echo lasts only as long as the person's shout. The clause, it <clears throat> it has entered there, means that the echo entered the crevices and holes in the earth. That's okay. it. 114. Rabbi Shimon rejoiced and said, um, Sorry. If I'd only be privileged to hear only this utterance, it would be enough to make me happy. For I have succeeded in hearing words of truth about this world. He said to him, this messenger, a holy pious one, if you only knew the joy of the words in that world, in the presence of the head of the academy, you would rejoice even more. Let's have Zeb read notes 182 and 183. 182. Um, if I have been privileged, similar exclamations appear in rabbinic literature and often in the Zohar, and it gives a whole bunch of citations. Uh, 183, yes. o- o- hi- holy pious one, the spiritual messenger addresses Rabbi Shema. Okay, he said to him, What innovations was there now when you came to me? In other words, you were just there. You heard something new, obviously. Tell me. He replied, the head of the academy opened with a verse saying, so he's, now quoting, he's quoting the head of the academy, this messenger. 
Joseph will lay his hand on your eyes. I think that's in next week's parsha, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's in Raichi. Why is, which is an expression, actually, it might be in this week's parsha, uh, which is an expression that uh, uh, the seller is understanding it is as when somebody dies, you close that person's eyes. So, meaning Joseph will be there when you die. Why is there joy in closing the eyes of the dead? Begin the Ainun Gavnan the Hayoma Inun. Because the eyes are colors of this world. The Khezu the Yukna the Hayalma Bahu. A vision and image of this world. Iu Astamine Hayalma, Khezu the Hayalma. This world is and its vision are concealed from him. So there's an ancient custom, the Zohar says, calls it a very ancient custom. Tra- tracing it back to this verse in chapter 46, verse 4 of Genesis that we're reading in the Torah now, uh, to closing the eyes of the deceased. Okay, 184 and 85, please, Zef. Is this, uh, th- this is like, you know, two, we, we never say this, but like two voices can't be heard at the same time. This is almost like two things can't be seen at the same time. Like we can't yeah. see the, yeah. Yeah, you can't you can't go into the next world with your with your uh, with the eyes of this world. Yeah, but you also have this concept though of um, we we talked about this on Der Kabbalah of um, um, the crossroads where Tamar and Judah met. Yehuda met um, was is called Patah Anayim, is the opening of the eye or the eyes, and what exactly happens at the opening of the eye. And what is there between this world and the next? Yeah. So it's like the portal, the place. But I guess the eyes closing is allowing for the, the other eye to open. You know, they're both true. Yeah, but the other eye, the third eye, uh, according to others, you know, is something that, can, that remains open while the other ones are closed also. Not to sound too weird, you know, we all have a we all have a third eye within us, whether we care to uh, accept it or not. Okay, so let's read the notes of one eighty four. What innovation was there now? Rabbi Shimon wishes to know what new teaching was being offered just now in the Heavenly Academy, and one eighty five. Joseph will lay his hand on your eyes. The verse records God's promise to Jacob as the angel, uh, as the aged patriarch journeys towards Egypt to re, uh, reunite with his long lost son, Joseph. It reads in full, I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I myself will surely bring you up as well. <sighs> Excuse me. And Joseph will lay his hands on your eyes. The head of the academy wonders why God's promise to Jacob includes the assurance that Joseph will close the patriarch's eyes when he dies. What joy is there in this act? He explains that the eyes represent the entire spectrum of the physical world. And as a person dies, uh, passes away, this world and its vision are concealed from him. And a new vista opens the afterlife. The shutting of the eyes marks this transition. See Zohar uh, 226a on the significance of the eye and... and um, Derech Eretzuta, in the name of Rabbi Shmuel the, uh, of Shmuel the Small, this world resembles a human eyeball. The white in it is the ocean surrounding the whole world. The black in it is the inhabited world. The pit of the black is Jerusalem. The visage in the part in the pit of the eye is the temple. Mm. It may be rebuilt speedily in our, in our days. We skipped a part in there as well. What's that? The visage in the pit, the reflection of one's own face seen in the pupil of another yeah. person's yeah. eye. Yeah, that's, yeah. Beautiful. Okay, let's just finish this page. Um Astimu Enai. Begin the Ainun Gavna the Hayama in the Hezu Dikna the Hayama. You asked the Mine Hayama Hezu the Hayama. Astimu Enoi, Kohezu the Hayama, or Iskasha Pine. 
Rabbi Shimon said. You're... Keep, reading. Keep reading. You're a little behind I'm... me. No, I'm for, I'm, I just read this. Astimu enoi kolchezu da hayalma ho ischashach minei. Yeah, keep reading. Chvecheshchem minei chezu da enoi lesle chezu ba hayalma mitaman alahala. Oh, you're up there, Shimon. I'm Rabbi Shimon. Yoz tikuna de kadmoi vechachmasa belahon yatim in malachim kadishon. Rabbi Shimon said, fine is the regulation of the ancient ones. Their wisdom surpasses that of the holy angels. So first he's been comparing this new knowledge to superior to what King Solomon was able to understand. And now he's comparing it to above what angels can understand. Why of all sons would Joseph lay his hand? I mean, you know, he's one of 12, uh, if you, 13, if you say, because delay of the good tidings about him, then the verse should read, you will see Joseph alive. Meaning, is it, because the simple meaning is, Yosef will be there, you know, like, go down, to, God is promising, it's in this part, I'm pretty sure, God is telling, um, you know, Joseph, uh, Jacob, Go down to Egypt. You'll see your son. It's an expression. He'll, lay, he'll put your, his hands on your eyes, meaning he'll touch you. You'll see him with your own eyes. Right? So, okay, that could be one explanation. But if it doesn't mean that, because it's always says it doesn't really mean that, it really is an expression about death. So why is it about Joseph? Go on. But, but will lay his hand because he is... He is with his love. Thus, the light of this world was concealed from one and obtained by the other. One who shuts the eyes of his beloved demonstrates as follows. Your vision of this world is lost. Now I am the vision instead. From now on, another vision of that world will be arranged for you. Okay, let's read note 187, and we're going to call it a night. Or 186, which is one line Z. 186. Uh, the regulation of the ancient ones to close the eyes of the one who died. 187. 187. Why of all his sons? Why does the verse state that Joseph would be the one to close Jacob's eyes? If scripture intended to emphasize the good news that Joseph was still alive, then the verse should promise that you will see Joseph alive, and the, not the opposite, that Joseph will shut Jacob's eyes. However, since Joseph was Jacob's most beloved son, God was informing the patriarch that Joseph would inherit the vision of this world, while Jacob would obtain vision of the world beyond. Powerful. 